Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, can everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, well, um, I'm quite aware that it's, uh, it's a nice warm evening here in London, um, and so you, we would just going to have to bear with us in relation to the, uh, the temperatures in here. Um, but um, thank you for coming along. My name is Dominic Jaynes, and this is one of a series of events that the University of the Arts London have been putting on and will continue to put on over the next um, 12 months. And the, the title of the series is called The Chairs Present, which is a slightly strange phrase. It sort of suggests, you know, furniture getting up and coming alive. Um, these are referring to the university chairs or professors that were appointed um, a year ago in a range of different subjects. Um, and I'm one of those people. And my subject is a rather broad area of um, <clears throat> cultural and visual studies. Now, within that, um, I work particularly in queer history, queer visual culture. And uh, when I was asked to organize uh, a chairs event, um, I thought, well, the obvious thing to do is to talk, uh, is to get some people in who are luminaries <laughs> in the field of broadly speaking, visual culture, and also queer visual culture, um, and whose work I know has touched on and been involved with the uh, very important queer theorist, writer, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. Now, as it so happens, um, this is the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of Eve Sedgwick's um, remarkable book, The Epistemology of the Closet, which is very kind of close to my... Um, kind of academic heart, um, because it was partly the inspiration for a research project uh, and a book that I've, I've written called um, Picturing the Closet. So this is partly an excuse to kind of pander to my interests, but there you go. Um, and, um, and also to have, once we're finished in here, a, a kind of wine reception. Um, and, you know, if anyone wants to talk to me about my book, that's perfectly fine. But the other thing about this evening is that it's called Chairs Present, um, because I'm meant to be presenting other people rather than just going on for too long myself. So um, I'm just going to introduce to you very briefly Whitney Davis, as you can see. Thank you. Binarisms and Binds, Epistemology of the Closet at 25. Written in the late 1980s context of an open season on gay men in public discourse, not to speak of gay bashing and health crisis, the central claim of Cedric's epistemology of the closet remains as exciting to me now as it was 25 years ago. An understanding of virtually any aspect of Western culture must be not merely incomplete, but damaged in its central substance to the degree that it does not incorporate a critical analysis of modern homo-heterosexual definition, an operation that intersects every issue of power and gender and transforms the other languages and relations by which we know. Cedric didn't greatly revise the history of that process of definition from 1880 to 1980. David Halperin's 100 Years of Homosexuality denominated, as Foucault had emphasized, as a species in the field of eroticism and sex, in which one particular sexuality was distinctively constituted as secrecy. But in virtuoso readings of public discourse in the 1980s and of earlier American, British, and French novels, she unraveled the radical and irreducible incoherence of the definition, its constituting contradictions, about which she, she said, there were no epistemological grounds for adjudicating or arbitrating as to their truth. Above all, what she identified in her famous figure two as minoritizing versus universalizing models of sexual orientations and separatist versus liminal transitive understandings of their relations to gender identifications. In fact, the versus she showed was itself misleading, obscuring the overlay between the ostensible poles of the putative contradiction. Rather than bang on about essentialism versus constructivism then, she advised us to explore the overlap of biosocial philog phylogenies and sociocultural ontogenies of homosexual desire. 
of the homosexual as species and other sexualities not so naturalized, such as the masturbator, of gay and lesbian self-descriptions that deserve proprio-descriptive authority, and her 14 common sense descriptions of erotic preferences that we all know in practice and in ourselves and in others. At the time for me, this was all bravura deconstruction, true to its time. I took it that finding the textures of the homosocial, the homoerotic, and the homosexual in the heteronormative, already done brilliantly in Between Men, was a deconstructive act of rhetorical defamiliarization in a, quote, conceptual landscape in which ideological rigor across all levels is not at all possible, and about which her own findings, she said, could only be resolutely non-algorithmic, uncertain about how far insights would be generalizable. To be sure, I understood that she knew the solvents of deconstructive criticism only go so far, and that there were, if not algorithms, then a set of crucial imperatives that had to be recognized as categorical. To wit, anti-homophobia as the explicit stance of all critical analysis, recognition of irreducibility in sexuality to terms and relations of gender, insistence that erotic identity is never to be circumscribed simply as itself, can never not be relational, is never to be known by anyone outside a structure of transference and countertransference, an injunction I took on in writing a book on the emergence of a homoerotic intersubjective sexuality between Freud and his patient, the Wolfman, and the thesis that switch points for the cyclonic epistemological undertoes that encompass issues of homosexual desire can be described with fair precision, algorithms or not, and when described, can at points be adjudicated, epistemological grounds or not. What we might read then as Cedric's own contradictoriness about contradictions. But instead of deconstructing her, I propose that she developed a very definite theory of a very particular existential and epistemological phenomenon at the very heart of the closet's overlappings of knowns and unknowns, of explicit and inexplicit, of silences as speech acts louder than words, indeed of what even counts as a speech act in the closet, that place where one is and one isn't, wants to and won't, can't and does, comes out as not out and closets as not not out, and so on. The space where the accessibility to knowledge of one's own homoerotic desires and potentials and those of others is uniquely, in her marvelous phrase, uniquely preterited, which I'd interpret to mean past speaking. Before addressing Cedric's definite theory, I must note that the contradictoriness of the closet as the personhood available to gay men the paradoxes of both staying in and coming out are such that there cannot be a categorical thou shalt come out, a salvational epistemologic certainty of gay lib, which Cedric distrusted. This field of radical and irreducible incoherence differs from the mere contradictions to which the closet must adapt. Mere contradictions, I read her to say, that must be called out for what they are. Faulty reasoning. Double speak. Epistemology of the closet opens with a 90 page axiomatic introduction, not so much dealing with English literature as with American law. Notably, a devastating and incredibly funny critique of Byron White's majority opinion in Bowers versus Hardwick, affirming the legality of state anti sodomy statutes. Sedgwick unpacked seven levels of its obtuseness, imagining the feelings of participants a closeted gay court assistant, a closeted justice, injured by its assaultive sentences, but unable to protest, even to name their dismay when trapped in the distinctive structure of the closet. And she explored other cases, the notorious Acanfora ruling, a teacher dismissed for not disclosing his prohibited homosexuality, as examples of the illogic of homophobia, stupid, brutal, and unjust. Her analysis of the minoritizing and universalizing registers of the homosexual panic defense, the gay basher's plea 
that he had to fend off a sexual advance by beating up the gay guy has special theoretical interest. In effect, the homosexual panic defense performs a double act of minoritizing tax taxonomy. There is, it asserts, one distinct minority of gay people and a second minority, equally distinguishable from the population at large, of latent homosexuals whose insecurity about their own masculinity is so anomalous as to permit a plea based on diminution of norm normal moral responsibility. At the same time, the efficacy of the plea depends on its universalizing force, on whether it can create a climate in which the jurors are able to identify with the perpetrator by saying, my goodness, maybe I would have reacted the same way. The reliance of the homosexual panic plea on the fact that this male definitional crisis is systemic and endemic is enabled only and precisely by its denial of the same fact. In Between Men, Sedgwick, she says that she was unaware at the time of the homosexual panic defense, had herself theorized homosexual panic as a structural principle applicable to the definitional work of an entire gender, hence of an entire culture, the most private, psychologized form in which many 20th century Western men experience their vulnerability to social pressures of homoerotic feeling, its disavowal or prohibition, and its punishment, including blackmail and assault. But it was the judicial concept denoting a legalized social inaction of the structural homosexual panic that defines modern male psyches that helped her theorize the epistemology of the closet as precisely not the mere contradictoriness and obfuscation of the many homophobias written into law and public policy, and for that matter, much of modern literature. No, the long list of binarisms through which male same-sex desire performs its chiastic unknowings of self and world, its world mapping. Here are the full lists Sedgwick worked through in her readings of Billy Budd and the picture of Dorian Gray in the two chapters called Some Binarisms. These are binarisms that must be thought, their contents known, in the terrifying epistemological register of the double bind. When I read Epistemology of the Closet in 1990, I was deeply involved with radical psychoanalysis, phenomenological psychiatry, and transferential psychology. In that very year, I wrote a long, rev long review of a new book in art history, Donald Preziosi's Rethinking Art History, which used double bind as its main label for art history's inabilities to think beyond binarisms like form, content, intention, non-intended, art, not art. Preziosi's usage was under-theorized, but Sedgwick's, Sedgwick's version was well-theorized, though I didn't pick it out at the time, perhaps because for me, her literary deconstructions occluded somewhat the analytic lifting enabled by her double-bind theory, which is not deconstructive and hermeneutic, but systems theoretical and algorithmic, approaches to which I've inclined in my more recent work on the theory of visual culture, and maybe the reason I'm now so struck on rereading the book 25 years later to see it so prominently in Sedgwick. I won't use double bind in its colloquial sense of an impasse, of a catch-22, the familiar I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't, though such cognitive dissonances do contribute to the contradictions of homo-hetero definition. I'll use it in the technical sense given to it by R.D. Lang and above all by Gregory Bateson, building on the theory of logical types developed by Russell and Whitehead and on models of multi-layered communication, especially about love and sex, and its inner conflicts at different logical levels. Damned if I do, damned if I don't, that's a bind. Double bind, terrible things happen to people who reject damnation. For Bateson, a double bind imposes a primary negative injunction, a secondary negative injunction that conflicts with the first at a more abstract level, though also enforced by punishment, and a tertiary negative injunction prohibiting the subject, the victim, from escaping the field. In the Ur communicative matrix of the loving interaction of infant and mother, primary negative injunction, don't, do not do so and so or I will punish you. Secondary negative injunction conflicting with the first at a more abstract level, do not question my love, of which my primary proposition is an example. 
a tertiary negative injunction prohibiting the victim from escaping the field. My promises of love are capricious. I'll always keep you in suspense. The child is punished for discriminating accurately what his mother is communicating, and he is punished for discriminating inaccurately. He can make no meta-communicative statement to find out which message he should respond to. In any response, she will only amplify the double bind. And he can't opt out and walk away. There is no not caring about the relationship. As, Sedg as Sedgwick understood the matter, the many binds of in and or out for the subject of homoerotic feelings and for all the other people affected by his ways of being in the closet and coming out or not or both are double bound by the fact that for him, there is no alternative metaphor that can map so much of his world. Or at any rate, Cedric said, there has not yet been such a metaphor. Open secret, maybe, a vivid metaphor identified by D.A. Miller in the novel and the police. Open secret might liberate or it might inhibit, but it doesn't undo the contradictory invisibility of the secret. Double bind, the potential for transformation is itself bound. At the extreme then, as Bateson said, the subject of systemic double binding can adapt only in schizophrenia, in his idiosyncratic understanding of what that might mean. Not really disintegration of mind, but inaccessibility of the feedbacks that enable it to self-correct the distortions of thought always flowing from human speech acts as the continuous inevitable, inevitable breaching of logical types. An illness of communication to be repaired by the metacommunication that allows me, when I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't, to reject my damnation. Cedric's epistemology of the closet explores the excruciating systems of double binds, systematically oppressing gay people, identities, and acts by undermining through contradictory constraints in discourse the grounds of their very being. These systems aren't quite the systems of discursive classification that called homosexuality into being, Foucault's analysis of the invention of the invert. Rather, they're the contradictory constraints in discourse that foreclose its potentials of fully being, Cedric's closet. Still, I venture to say that Foucault, trained in existential psychology, would have been interested in Cedric's reformulation if he had lived to read it. Bateson believed that double binds can be ameliorated by creative application of logic and reasoning. Historicizing and contextualizing them, we expose conflicting injunctions circulating at different logical levels though cohabiting in every illocutionary act. Sedgwick shared Bateson's conviction that all mere illogics should be refuted, hence her critiques of homophobic statutes and policies. But she seemed less optimistic that the double binds of the closet, the structure of contradictions that sets up the entire field of sexuality, can be unwound. I have no optimism at all, she wrote, about the availability of a standpoint of thought from which the questions could be intelligibly, never mind efficaciously, adjudicated, given that the same yoking of contradictions has presided over all the thought on the subject that has gone to form our own thought. Instead, the more promising project would seem to be a study of the incoherent dispensation itself the indisseverable girdle of incongruities under whose discomforting span for most of a century have unfolded the most generative and the most murderous plots of our culture. I read this tonight with the same despair that overtook me when I read it in 1990. Cedric had faith in the potential of literary deconstruction its unwinding of binarisms recounted in imaginative forms to unfold critically the unfolding of the most degenerative and most murderous plots of our culture. But I'm no longer a deconstructionist and I never was a literary critic. I'm a pragmatist art historian. 
I hold the simple theory that culture, thought, will change unpredictably in real feedbacks in human social coordination that don't require impossible transformations of the entire field of thought, only adjustments in replicating the actual forms, that is, in metaphorizing them. I conclude with a little parable from Uncommon Therapy, a book about Bateson's follower, the strange and wonderful American psychiatrist, Milton Erickson, his interviewer. Suppose someone called you and said there was a kid, 19 or 20 years old, who's been a very good boy, but all of a sudden this week he started walking around the neighborhood carrying a cro large cross. The neighbors are upset and the family's upset, and would you do something about it? How would you think about that as a problem? Some kind of bizarre behavior like that. Erickson, well, if the kid came in to see me, the first thing I would do would be to want to examine the cross. And I'd want to imp I would want to improve it in a very minor way. As soon as I got the slightest minor change in it, the way would be open for a larger change. And pretty soon I could deal with the advantages of a different cross. He ought to have at least two. He ought to have at least three so he could make a choice each day of which one. It's pretty hard to express a psychotic pattern of behavior over an ever-increasing number of crosses. Thank you. A hard act to follow. Thank you both very much. Um, I'm delighted to be part of today's conversation, and I want to thank Dominic for inviting me. And I've got a lovely book rest, a lovely um, paper stand here, a lectern made up of a pile of your books. So that's a nice way to start. This talk comes from an ongoing project of mine that addresses a gap in my own considerations of gender and Orientalism in which the lesbian associations of the harem have often been the sub rather than the main text of my work. Today, I'm giving a snapshot of two women, the Ottoman Turkish Muslim author Selma Ekrem and the Polish Danish artist Elizabeth Jericho Bauman, in order to think about the place of homoeroticism in cultural production by Western and Ottoman women writers and artists. Sedgwick taught us to recognize the productivity of the closet in establishing and enshrining a binarized model of sexuality for Western modernities, using Euro-American literary cultures for her case studies. Tonight, I'm going to focus on what are sometimes called non-Western modernities. I want to explore how the different organization of gender and desire in Islamic gender-segregating societies produces different versions of the homosocial and the heterosexual and the homosexual. Each of these terms are themselves, of course, also simultaneously constituted by and constitutive of the Western sexual identifications and gendered cultures of which Sedgwick initially wrote. One of the great strengths for me of Sedgwick's work has always been how considerations of race and ethnicity and class are integral to her conceptualization of the field of sexuality and gender in an intellectual framework that's firmly anchored, as we've been hearing, in feminist, anti-imperial, and anti-racist scholarship and activism. My work is especially linked to debates about the racialization of discursively produced gender and sexual identities. I also take from Sedgwick's thoughtfulness about materiality an emphasis on the determining role of the market, in this case, the market for Orientalism, in the articulation, distribution, and consumption of cultural forms concerned with sex, gender, and ethno-national religious identities and their related pleasures. And I especially love Jason taking us through the materiality of her books and other products. Focusing on the construction of Safism in the Seraglio, I want to put discussion about sexual and gender identities in the context of competing imperialisms and multiple Orientalist cultures. Thinking about histories of sexuality in the plural and in relation to multiple modernities is, I argue, essential to understanding the transcultural movement of bodies, ideas, and cultural commodities that were framed through the mutually constituting relations of, in my case, Ottoman, 
and Euro-American imperialisms. Experiences of and encounters with segregated female life could be turned into valuable cultural commodities for Middle Eastern Muslim women who lived in harems and for Muslim and non-Muslim women from the region who did not and for Western women visitors, all of whose lives were impacted by the veiling regimes, to use Anna Sikor's phrase, that regulated segregated sociality. The, lo the logics of female privileged access produced a USP, a unique selling point, that simultaneously created a market for women's work and that restricted what they could represent. Those who wanted to challenge negative Western stereotypes about harem women often declaimed against the prurient nature of most discussions of harem sexuality. And thinking especially about Dominic's work, Dominic's work on visual arts and queer secrets, I note that historically, when women's work does signal the presence of sexual activity, and indeed of perverse sexualities, it appears more often in literary than in visual form. Women writers could use third person descriptions to narrate shocking events of which they ostensibly had no personal experience. And then I left, and then the next day, the slaves told me blah, blah, blah had happened. Women artists, however, risk being tainted by association since the conventions of visual orientalism more closely impute the artist as a direct observer of, if not participant in, the scene depicted. This is Henriette Brown's um, harem visit. Mary Roberts identifies what she calls the prosaic narrative of the harem as a social realm, as itself, she says, a catalyst for exotic female fantasy. The oft-reported experiences of having clothes, faces, and bodies examined by Ottoman women renders Western women writers part of the visuality of the harem experience. A narcissistic gratification that Mary writes establishes their own priority in the harem. At the same time as, I propose, the tactile joy or joys of the domestic harem mise-en-scene facilitate pleasurable points of projection and identification for women readers or viewers. Long-standing discussions of the female gaze have, since Laura Mulvey's first analyses, expanded to include consideration of an active female gaze marked by class, ethnicity, and sexuality. For Ottoman and Middle Eastern women writers and artists, I attend to the multiple and ethnicized female gazes activated in their representation of orientalized bodies during a period of modernization and westernization in which interaction with the Western gaze played a central role in changing local definitions of gender and sexuality. Moving away from the initially Euro-American focus of histories of sexuality, more recent accounts of multiple modernities evaluate the structural role of heteronormativity as a transnational phenomenon, encountered in, transformed by, and transformative of diverse local discourses of sexuality and gender such as the transition from male homosociality to modernizing heterosociality, argued by Najma Bandi for Iran, and relatedly by Za'evi for the Ottoman Empire. In calling for attention to same-sex affectivity, her term, between women in medieval Europe, their term, sorry, Sultzman and Scheingorn proposed that a pre-modern subject might have a self-perception of same-sex desires independent of the existence of a related social category of public identity, such as the modern homosexual. Trampo transposed to other times and places, this approach makes visible, ambiguous same-sex attachments that would otherwise, they say, disappear when narrow, binary readings of a lesbian slash heterosexual opposition prevail. Alongside revisions to the historical record, Forms of cultural analysis informed by queer theory point out possible same-sex interpretations and pleasures in the present consumption of historical sources. Despite that this willingness to validate the investigator's queer pleasures without always being able to trace contemporaneous readings may, as James Smalls puts it, and he quote, I quote him, great against my art historical grain, reception studies meld with queer theory to create alternative visual and literary genealogies of sources that have a history of being read with same-sex pleasure, 
without having to, to claim that their cultural producers were themselves gay. It's not my purpose to classify writers or artists as lesbian or queer or heterosexual. I want to recuperate the queer pleasures that their sources might offer or might have offered to female gazes of all complexions in the context of ethnic, racial, religious, and national identities, themselves sexualizing and racializing. In framing these libidinal effects as homoerotic, I don't exclude heterosexual women or heterosexual female pleasure. The relationship between gazes, acts, identifications, and pleasures provided by the harem offers objects of potential desire that go beyond binarized gender. The sexual subjecthoods of some authors might seem recognizably heterosexual or proto-lesbian, as with the Ottoman Turk, Selma Ekrem, who emigrated age 21 to the United States in 1923 23, to find freedom, as told in her 1930 memoir, Unveiled, the Autobiography of a Turkish Girl. With Turkish synonymous with Muslim in the parlance of the day, Ekrem's title keys into Orientalist fascinations with the harem, despite that Ekrem herself did not live in one. Nonetheless, she was like other Turkish, that is Muslim women, subject to externally imposed conservative gender restrictions from a wartime Muslim community determined to protect its women, qua its nation. This escalated during the humiliating post-war occupation of Istanbul by the Allies. Fiercely nationalist, Ekrem was nonetheless happy to settle in the United States where she was able to construct a life outside marriage with a female companion. A plate in her memoir shows Ekrem as a young woman in Constantinople, dressed in masculine style clothing, in a photograph captioned, The West and the East, Selma Ekrem and her sister Berat. Berat with a shashaf, the, the, um, top, the top part of her um, Islamic covering, or Muslim modest covering, I should say, over her hair, stands with Selma, who, sporting a white shirt and polka dot tie tucked into belted pinstripe trousers with a masculine style jacket, poses with her free hand in her trouser pocket, raffishly holding back one side of her open jacket. Ekrem's bouffant hair is swept back from her face and behind her ears, not yet the short, sharp shingle bog bob that adorns her frontispiece photo. Positioned as the last plate in the book, that one, in a chapter describing Ekrem's arrival in America, the image reinforces the memoir's locational drive to find, quote, freedom in the West where women could be unveiled. Whilst the provenance of the picture is not known, it must predate Ekrem's emigration, since her urbane sister would not have retained the Shah Shaf once the new Turkish Republic had encouraged women to exchange veils for hats as a sign of modernity. Although her sister's hair is hidden, both young women had in fact already dispensed with the long hair conventionally valued as a sign of Ottoman female beauty. Beret's hair had become poorly conditioned in the privations of the war, and her mother had allowed her to have it cut. Selma also had begged her cousin, who was doing the hair cutting, to cut hers into a matching long bob. The amateur haircut was a disaster, and Ekrem, she says, joined in the horrified laughter on one condition, and her one condition was that the local village barber would come and cut my hair like a boy's. There was no other way out of it. Having parlayed a feminine domestic coiffure crisis into a desired refit that transgressed gender norms in style and in mode of execution, the barber imported from the male homosociality of his establishment was, quote, shocked to be asked to come to the house and cut a girl's hair. Ekrem had also to utilize her social and educational capital to cross ethno-religious boundaries of nation. She writes, with that hair and a hat, I could not be Turkish. Surely I must be an eccentric American left in Istanbul by mistake. And speaking only English in public, with pretense and fear, I wore my hat. Whilst the Orientalist logic of the caption appears to contrast two different types of ethnicized femininity, East and West, the inclusion of Ekrem's dandified presentation makes it also a contrast in terms of gender. 
When published in 1930 in her book, the image could potentially be read as an indication of Ekram's forward-looking affinity with Euro-American modernity, in which, as Laura Doan argues for British fashion before the Well of Loneliness trial in 1928, women wearing masculine style attire were commonly perceived as fashionable rather than deviant. Observers, Laura says, could be divided, quote, into those in the know, those unknowing, and those who knew but didn't know. With garçon fashion trends traveling to the Ottoman elite, the decision to include this family photo in the book suggests, at least to those who know what to look for, something about sexuality that goes beyond a generic desire for female independence. This knowing may be why I have for so long been fascinated and wondered how to deal with the overt sexualization that I see in Elizabeth Jericho Bauman's often monolithic orientalist female types. And I've contrasted her, this is uh, Jericho Bauman on the left, and I've contrasted her with a more um, classically insipid, if not bored, um, young woman in Sophie Anderson's painting in the harem Tunis. I was riveted by Mary Douglas's account of Jericho Bauman's friendship with the Ottoman Egyptian princess, Nasla Hanum, which dated to Jericho Bauman's, oh, I'm sorry, that's really pixelated, first visit to Istanbul in 1869. This is Nasla Hanum. Their relationship was rekindled when Jericho Bauman returned in 1874. By 1874, Nasla Hanum had been married for two years to the Ottoman diplomat, reformer, and art collector, Halil Sharif Pasha. And she was herself a patron, and she was a participating artist in the developing Ottoman exhibition culture. In Constantinople, Nasla Hanum had considerable power. But once Jericho Bauman and the two honorific commissioned portraits that Nasla Hanum had commissioned from her left the zone of Ottoman imperial influence, the imperialized difference worked against the young princess, and Jericho Bauman exhibited her portraits without permission. She also created a series of unauthorized erotic fantasies in print and in paint. Mary terms these paintings her Orientalist fantasies, which, like this one, the princess Nasla Hanum from 1875, reaffirmed, she says, the trope of the sensual harem beauty. However, Mary writes, Jericho Bauman's fantasy of the Orient fundamentally challenges Western gender categories because the female artist is positioned as a desiring subject. And yet she achieves this through works that are surprisingly similar to the familiar trope of the languid odalisque. How might we respond to the homoerotic potential of these Odalisque-like renditions of Jericho Bauman's patron and friend? I want to use the evident sexualization of these images to think about the opportunities offered by Orientalism for the expression of the polymorphous perversity of female heterosexuality. Where Mulvey's initial formulation would have rendered Jericho Bauman's objectifying and desirous scopophilia only as a temporary female transvestism. Critical thought since then on the female and the lesbian gaze has demonstrated the viability of a female desirous gaze that objectifies a woman from a female point of view without needing to match it to homosexual subject positions. The generic presumption of presence attributed to Western women reporters on the harem produces spectatorial positions offering libidinal pleasures from a variety of female perspectives. Roberts quotes an extract from Jericho Bauman's retrospective travelogue, which was called Motley Images of Travel, from 1881, and this quote jumped out at me. Oh, Nasla, to have to language among the barbarians, you budding rose surrounded by thorns, you who dream about the unknown, about this world of which you have only an inkling, you resemble a true pearl concealed between the hard, tightly closed blades of the shimmering mother shell. What will be your destiny? Will you be passed from hand to hand like a chattel, to be concealed and forgotten, or shimmer like the rest of your sisters? One doesn't have to stretch too far to see this as sapphic erotica. 
true pearl fits so neatly as a term for the clitoris, embedded between the hard, tightly closed vulvic fo folds of the feminized mother shell. That this is ostensibly presented as a description of Nasla Hanum herself as the hidden pearl emphasizes the passion of the language. While such almost purple prose is not uncommon in the literary canon of 19th century romantic friendships, neither should it be emptied of its erotic potential. The reference to being passed from hand to hand introduces a suggestion of multiple sexual partners or owners that in the Orientalist context invokes polygamy or polygyny, except that the polygynous harem was a sexual economy in which the single man passed between multiple women. By the time of publication, if not of writing, Nasla Hanum was a young widow, though Jericho Bauman could not have known that she would remain single. So the invocation of multiple sexual partners in the context of plural other women, the rest of your sisters, keeps Nasla Hanum in a domain of protected, projected multiple attachments. If Jericho Bauman's description of Nasla Hanum in her boudoir Sorry, in her description of the princess in her boudoir, the homoerotic libidinal drive gives the text the trappings of soft porn. I quote, for me, she was unforgettable. In these forget-me-not colored aromatic surroundings, Nasla lay on the soft pillow, her fragrance hair encircling her face like a halo. From the linen edged with real lace, one pink toe peeped out, and on the platform stood her white silver and pearl embroidered slippers, while at the door, the black slave woman Lala watched her like a dog, vigilant and faithful. I rest my case. The pink toe provides the crucial flash of flesh to invoke the rest of the lusciously supine body. A metonymic substitution that also secures Nasla's pale pigmentation. The toe's rosy softness providing a racializing contrast to the dark-skinned attendant presented in classically orientalist animalistic terms. As Mary Roberts writes, Jericho Bauman's desire to unveil the harem and her captivation with Nasla in particular is undisguised. Yet the nature of women's orientalist fantasy is, as we know from Zanana, itself socially and historically located, revealing, as Stola says, that the colonial, revealing, sorry, as Laura Stola says, the colonial order of things that underpinned the construction of European gender and social norms. Here, the ethnicized and imperialized difference between the two women appears as one of the conditions of possibility for the articulation of Jericho Bauman's active female desirous gaze and same-sex eroticism. Jericho Bauman also pasted, painted a number of um, orientalist types of unnamed women, like this odalisque on the far left there. But in these unnamed types, the investment in the princess does not disappear. The headdress and bracelet transmit from the body of the fantasy royal to that of the unnamed ethnographic type, uniting both pictured women as objects of the same gaze. The genre of harem literature established a tradition of Middle Eastern women using Western fashion to present themselves as modern. In Ekram's rendition of herself as westernized in clothes and body management, I detect a further investment in crafting a gender identity that is not normatively heterosexual. The freedom she seeks in transplanting the Turkish girl to America is perhaps the freedom to do girl or woman in a different way. Pivoting on gender and sexuality, she affects a version of transcultural femininity that does not appear to be available to her in the nationalist modernity of her homeland. For a Western woman artist, it was not simply that the Orient furnished additional locations for erotic and homoerotic depictions of the female form. It may well have provided one of the only rationales for such desirous images. In their testimony to the exercise of a female desirous gaze directed at another woman, they create the space for types of visual and literary pleasures rarely found in women's work of the period. To look at these sexually available figures, displayed provocatively by another woman, creates for a female viewer a position that is inherently desirous. The viewer's ability or willingness to fill the image with same-sex desire will depend on her historical moment and cultural competencies. 
just as it is the roving of my queer eye that seeks and finds sapphism in the seraglio. Thank you. For allowing me to be here, it's uh, absolutely wonderful to be at London College of Fashion. Uh, just to start off, Dominic asked me to say something about fashion. <laughs> Tonight, I'm working Gender Queer, The Barricades, 1871 Autumn Winter Collection. So, uh, what I'm going to do tonight is going to be somewhere in the middle of cabaret and a lecture. So, we'll see what happens. So, I'm Baird La Baird, and I'm a queer femme feminist performance artist. <laughs> That's me there pretending to be the senior curator of the Barbican Art Gallery. <laughs> And uh, so, as an artist, I uh, usually work with satire and spectacle. But over the past few years, I'll just show you some satire and spectacle, a bit more fashion. This is the Femme Police. You might, uh, I don't know if anyone saw this performance at uh, Ducky a few years ago at uh, Ducky Goes Girly. I'm sure there's lots of people who've been victims of fashion crime here. So. If you do want to come and talk to me afterwards, please do. But what I've done over the last few years is that uh, I have started to create performative tours which explore queer hidden histories on display in some of London's top museums. Tonight, I thought it was apt to talk about queer secrecy uh, and I wanted to read from probably one monologue that I created, oh, actually for, oh, I created for the Wallace collection, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I've been doing various things with museums. That This one is a, a lecture that I created about royal portraiture uh, before the 20th century. And this is one of my characters. Uh, this is Birdie Slipwear, and uh, she's a contemporary fine art uh, ceramics practitioner. And uh, I created it in response to an uh, exhibition called uh, Deception at the V&A. So, Verdi is all about deception. And, uh, yeah, okay. So, I am going to... Before I talk about the Wallace in more detail, now, with all you historians being here and academics and everything, I know that you'd all like to talk about methodology, <laughs> and you'd probably like to know what my primary sources are. Well, my first... <laughs> it's true. My first methodology is what is my gut feeling and what is my emotional reaction to a collection. Then after that, I jump to conclusions. <laughs> Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. <laughs> then I, I establish the conclusion with rumour and gossip. Failing all of that, I'll go to the primary source of Tinternet, where I'll usually find out a few more facts. So this is actually my process, but I, I, I'm a bit of a history nerd, but I may have got something wrong, so if you find something I've got wrong in this, come and tell me, and I'll change it next time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I did this in uh, the Wallace Collection in uh, February, and I was invited to uh, create this performance by one of my um, you know, mentors, the artist Sadie Lee, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who does a lot of LGBT work with museums. So, first of all, I want to tell you a bit about the Wallace, because it's just around the corner. How many of you have been to the Wallace? Okay, excellent. Lots of you will know it. If you haven't been, go. The Wallace Collection is one of Britain's smallest grand houses. Its relatively pint-sized proportions distill luxury till it feels super concentrated. 
It's just at the back of Oxford Street. It's free. And the open house policy means that you can get up close and intimate with some of the interiors of ye old super rich. You can see the Laughing Cavalier. And you can see some of Madame de Pompadour's favorite smut. The Wallace is one of my favorite places in London, somewhere I love to work myself up into a frenzy, thinking about the relationship between high art and exploitation. Before I begin my pieces, I should point out that the yarn I'm going to tell gets incredibly confusing because the dynasty who owned the house and amassed the collection went by the names of Seymour Conway, Hartford, Wallace, and Jackson. The reason for this is because aristocrats like to give themselves as many names as they have houses. It makes them sound more important. Some of the family were illegitimate and inherited the wealth, but not the titles. Without further ado, I'm going to... Oop. It's not meant to be displayed like that. I've just swapped it over from uh, my computer to this computer, but what it says on it is it says, my monologue is called A Spectre is Haunting the Wallace Collection. So there's the Wallace Collection there. You all know that the preface to the communist, I know you all do know, don't you? The preface to the communist manifesto opens with the great line, a spectre is haunting Europe. And I'm going to elaborate on that and suggest that a spectre also haunts the Wallace collection, and that spectre is revolution. You'll notice that many of the objects in the Wallace collection are from 18th century France. This reflects the taste of the aristocratic collectors who were obsessed with the Ancien Regime. Being a Rococo communist myself, I also share their fascination. After the French Revolution, many of the aristos lost their heads and their chateaus. The fine objects inside them were bought up by other European arist ar aristocrats, such as the Hartford Wallace dynasty. The object I'm going to talk about is the Wallace Fountain. You pass it on the entry into the house, and I want to introduce you to two people who are intimately connected by the fountain. This is Louise Michel, our heroine, and this is Richard Wallace. The fountain is one of a series designed by Wallace and given to the Parisians so that working class people could have access to free drinking water. And if you go to Paris, you can still drink out of them today. This is Richard Wallace, or Dickie, as I'm going to call him, the bastard son of the fourth Marquess of Hartford, who inherited the collection. We have him and his wife to thank for bequeathing the collection to the people. And this is Louise Michel, the bastard daughter of a serving maid, Marianne Michel, and a minor French aristocrat who I won't bother naming. Louise was an anarchist, an activist, a poet, a teacher, and a cross-dresser who was rumored to have loved women. She's also known as the Grand Dame of Anarchism. And what connects them all and the Wallace Collection is the workers' uprising of Paris in 1871. The, the 1871 uprising is not as widely known as the revolution in, uh, of 1789. I actually knew very little about it before I started the research, but it was a pivotal moment in working class struggle and probably one of the first successful revolutions that was purely, truly people led. The other one being the uh, slave rebellion of he French Haiti of 1791 to 1804. To sum up what happened in the, in the, the, the uh, 1871 situation, is that Paris was at war with the Prussian Empire. The Prussians had the upper hand and invaded France, laying siege to Paris. The siege last months. The Parisians suffered terribly, and up here in this photo here, no, sorry, it's not a photo, it's an illustration, and they are suffering terribly, and they're eating anything, including les chats, 
a le canivo, that is, cats and rats. In the meantime, Dicky is slumming it in Marie Antoinette's old apartment with his miserly old reclusive father at the time. He comes to the rescue with food and hospitals. Now, how Dicky managed to bankroll this is très intéressant. He had that kind of cash, not only because the family was super rich, because his grandfather and his father before him were so terrified of revolution that they kept a stash of ha cash handy just in case the peasants kicked off again like you did in 1789 and you would do again in 1848. Meantime, the working class of Paris lead the defense of the city against the Prussians. The French government are weak and capitulate retreating to Versailles. The working class seize the moment and take the city. Yay! They become known as the communards. <laughs> and yes, Jimmy Somerville and the Reverend Richard Coles did name the band after them. The Parisian communards' other musical claim to fame is the socialist anthem, the Internationale, which was penned in their honor by Eugene Poitier. The workers organized and set up government which lasts for 72 glorious days. During this time, while they are defending the city, they establish rights for women, Hooray! free education, Hooray! improved working conditions. Hooray! They even find time to put on street theater. There we go. So, Women like Louise Michel play a central role in all aspects of the uprising, including hand-to-hand -hand combat. They are vilified in the press for not being docile and nice, and they become known as the, pet the petrolos, which means arsonists, because lots of buildings were uh, set on fire uh, at the time. So, let's take an interlude. Oh, and uh, I thought you might have liked to, would you like to see some more petrolos? I give you the petrolos. I'll leave it to you to work out why I'm interested in this subject. So, uh, yeah, lots of the petrolos wear uh, cross dresses. Lots of them wearing uniforms. But let's go to Louise Michel, also known as Clemence Louise. That was her drag name. Louise Michel had strong bonds to women and men throughout her life. But ultimately, she declared that she loved the revolution best. She was infamous for wearing male attire and is known as the Red Virgin of Rom Montmartre. When I first read about Louise Michel, I got excited and jumped to all sorts of conclusions. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> but the more I learned, the more confusing it became. So here's Louise. During the uprising, she's accused of being a lesbian by the French right-wing uh, media. And then, after the revolution, the German fledgling LGBT media, LGBT media claim her as a lesbian. So what to do? Then, anarchist celeb Emma Goldman wades in, pisses all over my bonfire right, by writing an open letter to sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, in which she declares that, in Emma Goldman's words, that Michelle is a complete woman who just happens to be a gender nonconformist. And what had happened here is Magnus Hirschfeld had written um, an essay about why uh, Louise Michelle could be claimed as part of LGBT history. So, what's really interesting about this, though, is Goldman basically says... What does Goldman say? She says, she says, I love my homos very much. She's a bit like Joan Rivers here, if you can kind of imagine that. She says, I love my homos very much, but Louise Michelle is not one. She's a complete woman. But incidentally, Emma Goldman claimed that Havelock Ellis was an anarchist, even though he said he wasn't. So I take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Now, the complete woman doesn't exactly clear things up. 
WTF is a complete woman. And does it mean that a lesbian or a queer woman is an incomplete woman? Mm. Since then, scholars like you, Rainer, and busybodies like me have pawed over Louise Michelle's correspondence in search of evidence either way, whether she was or whether she wasn't. But it's really difficult because sexting hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> the answer is we'll never know for certain. But remember, historic figures rarely get asked to prove they're heterosexual unless they're accused of being gay. Back to the barricades, mes amis, and here's uh, Paris on fire. The defeated government in Versailles are not happy, and with many soldiers recently captured, released from capture, French troops eventually took back Paris from the communards. <sighs> and it gets worse. A bloody backlash began. An estimated 20,000 communards are executed tens of thousands of people are arrested and a further 7,500 people including our heroine Louise are jailed or sent to a French penal colony in New Caledonia in the South Pacific and here is uh, where the uh, communards were, were sent and this is one of the uh, boats departing with um, women uh, convicts being sent to the island I'm not sure whether they are actually uh, communards or not. Um, I'd have to do an MA or something to establish it properly. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, but what happens is that Louise engages in anti-colonial activities with the local Kanak people. So basically she doesn't stop. Dicky, back to Dicky, has now become a national hero. He decides enough is enough. The workers in Paris are just too uppity, so he ships his beloved collection out of Paris incognito. In meantime, he gifts his personally designed fountains, like the one you can see outside the Wallace, to the Parisian people. And here, I hope nobody's colorblind because the, uh, the green fountains are the uh, Wallace fountains, which you can still drink of. Dicky becomes and remains a national hero in Paris. I like to think of him as being a bit like Bono. <laughs> so, when the priceless treasures arrive in London, ever the philanthropist, Dickie puts the entire display on, uh, the entire collection on display in Bethnal Green, which is in the building which now houses the Museum of Childhood. Thousands of working class people get to go up at posh things for the first time ever, and it becomes an overnight sensation. Think of it as being a bit like a Victorian antiques roadshow. Louise Michel is released from the penal colony in 1880, and she came to London. The French government pardoned the communards. She continues to be a nuisance to her dying day. She died at the age of 74 on January the 5th, 1905. 120,000 people attended her funeral, which coincidentally was on the day that marked the beginning of the Russian Revolution. And so there ends my story of how the Wallace collection and revolution are forever connected. Each time you visit the Wallace, start off at the fountain, anoint yourself with the memory of the brave communards, ordinary workers, some of them cross dresses, some of them complete women, some of them incomplete women, <laughs> who died to improve conditions for working class people. I thank you.